Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as my mother said, my name is John, and uh, I won't go over my background again. Um, but today, I'm going to be talking about coins of the ancient world. Um, before I get to that, just a disclaimer, um, nowhere in that background was I an academic researcher or you know, uh, interested in the minutia of coins. I'm a hobbyist, but I will say that with that comes a little different perspective because most hobbyists are in the market for coins and they're collecting coins, buying coins and selling coins. So we see things oftentimes that are not locked away in a uh, uh, repository or a museum or things like that. So I'll do my best to give you guys a superficial overview of coins of the ancient world. Uh, so when I talk about coins of the ancient world, what I mean is coins, and that date's a little inaccurate because I ran out of time on the slides, I cut it back a little bit. Uh, it should be around the start of the 7th century BC and uh, on until about the end of the Western Roman Empire around 500 AD. So we're gonna go about 900,000 years of coins in the next 30, 40 minutes. And uh, I'm gonna set the timer for myself real quick just so I don't get too um, carried away. All right, so starting with coins. So before coinage in the ancient world, the main system of exchange was barter. So people would bring uh, merchandise, commodities, things to different parts of the world, ships and overland, and they would trade, uh, whether it was metals or agricultural products or whatever. It was um, rather unwieldy to carry hundreds of pounds of things around with you um, or just on trust with a royal decree. So people started trading raw amounts of metal, be it silver, gold, things like that. Um, and the natural emergence of coinage happened in three places in the ancient world simultaneously. Uh, the first was ancient China, the second was ancient India, and the third was in a region known as Lydia, which is in the western part of modern-day Turkey, or Anatolia, along the coast. Some of these names you might recognize, they are famous cities, and they all have their own unique histories throughout time. And we're gonna talk about the beginnings here, uh, because that is where our most important figure from the early part of coinage comes from. His name was Croesus. I don't know if that uh, name sounds familiar to you, but there's an expression, being rich as Croesus. Uh, and that really kind of originates with him because he was the first person to create a bimetallic uh, coinage, meaning separating the natural forming alloy of electrum into gold and silver. So up here, we have a coin, one of the earliest modern, or I guess, modern interpretations of a coin uh, from Croesus's father. And it was made out of the alloy electrum, which is naturally occurring blend of gold and silver. So Croesus took advantage of the natural resources and the abundance of gold and electrum in the area of his kingdom, in Lydia, and he minted a variety of different coins, um, and people privately minted them, different cities minted them. It became a popular form of expression of Bowen's pride in their city-state, in their region, in their god of preference that they would honor, and in some of the uh, abundant resources or merchandise they would trade, be it fish or grain or, you know, horses or whatever they would trade. So these coins were very popular in the beginning, um, but later, once Croesus was able to separate silver into gold, it became standard to use silver coinage. And gold was mainly, mainly for bankers and merchants that had lots and lots of uh, money they needed to store or trade at large. Um, in large quantities. So just to show you a few, I don't know what happened there in the corner, but I guess they magnified it. Uh, these are different denominations of Greek coins, and there's a lot, you don't need to know all of them, um, but the general idea was that it was based around one uh, unit, be it a stator or a drachma, and they were broken down in equal increments from there. So a heavy drachma, if anyone can follow the Greek and Latin roots of all these things, is a half drachma. You know, uh, an obol, if people recognize that word, was placed over the eyes of people uh, who, who died in the Mediterranean in this culture. Um, four of them is a tetraobol. Three of them is a tribal. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they became very, very diminutive <laughs> down to 1 48th, which you'll see later if uh, you come up and have a look at some of the coins that I have, is quite tiny. They were a size of maybe a pea. And the largest would get up to maybe the size of a, maybe a modern day silver dollar. So they came in a variety of sizes and they each had different imagery on them. And each area had their own standard as well. So the math breaks down different ways depending on the alliances that different city-states had. I won't go into all the detail, but just for your context. So here's a coin uh, of Croesus from the time period. So this one was minted in the middle of the 6th century BC. It shows a lion fighting against the bull. There have been a lot of theories about why it displays this, but I'm just going to show you pictures because I know a lot of people prefer that, not talk ad nauseum about this. And I'll let you kind of dwell on that, or if you're more interested, you can look up all that information later. So beyond Lydia, this coinage kind of became very popular as a means of exchange. It was much easier. It was a kind of a revolutionary and very popular idea as the root of all evil. And it uh, became popular with other Greek states. This one is from Aegina, which was an island nation off the uh, main coast of mainland Greece, as we now know it. And they show a sea turtle, because that was part of their empire was being a uh, very powerful naval um, city. Here's another one uh, uh, with a depiction of a uh, celery leaf on the outverse, on the reverse, has a punch mark um, that pushes the silver into a, a negative image that was carved out, known as a die. Um, so these were punched out by hand in very probably <laughs> hot and dirty uh, forges uh, in different city-states uh, in large quantities and traded across the uh, area. Now, as time went on, these, uh, these, these coins showed the evolution of art and the popularity of culture and events going on at the time. So throughout this, I just want you all to keep that in mind that the artistic uh, trends and focuses and skills of each of these city-states and of their eras and epochs advanced or changed along with the art that was going on. And I'm sure my mom has told you about all these different artistic trends throughout time. They are mimicked on coins. So here we have an archaic statue from Greece uh, showing that typical kind of style very static, very inspired by the Near East and Egypt, um, and equally mimicked on a coin, uh, sort of a two-dimensional figure. It's not something you wouldn't, uh, or something you wouldn't be surprised to see on a wall relief somewhere in the, the Levant or Egypt, or somewhere of that nature. Shows the god Poseidon. Again, here's an image of a uh, kind of archaic figure of Dionysus on a drachma from Naxos. This was around the uh, end of the sixth century in Sicily. And the famous tetradram of Athens. This is one of the most famous and widespread coins of the ancient world. And the Athenians minted many, many tens of thousands of these during the Peloponnesian War. And they are very abundant. Uh, today, not this very version. You can buy them for about seven, 800 bucks. And then as time went on, the archaic trends of more static kind of posture kind of evolved, and you can start to see more life, more movement, more perspective, more musculature and details. This is a rare coin depicting a discus thrower, an athlete. And in the background, you can see a tripod, which was given out as prizes to the best athletes in these competitions. And uh, it's, a, it's the beginning of a refinement in the artistic style. So, also mimicked in their statuary. This is a late Roman copy, uh, but it uh, imitates the great sculptor Myron's Discobolus statue of a thrower. And this was very inspirational late, later on in history during the uh, 19th century and beyond. Again, an archaic stator of Thassos and a later more refined version of the same coin. As time went on, the artistic quality improved even more. I'm just gonna show you some really beautiful coins. This is a tetradrum from Macedon, showing Dionysus, a little bit tipsy, riding home on a donkey. 
and a beautiful coin with a lock in, in a sort of locked in combat with a bull. Um, now, for context, this coin probably is no more than two inches in diameter. So the skill of these ancient die makers and engravers was uh, remarkable. And some of this sculpting quality, or I'd say most of the sculpting quality, would not really be imitated closely for another 2,000 plus years. So really the 18th century and beyond is when it started to reach this quality again. So it's remarkable for the time. Another uh, tetradram from Thrace with a griffin. One from Acragas in Sicily with an eagle and a crab. These are all symbols of the various places they came from. And a, uh, another tetradram from Messana in Sicily. The Sicilian coins are widely considered to be the most masterful, uh, and you'll see why in a moment, of the time period. Here's one from Sicily again, a beautiful rendering of a bullheaded creature. And one from Syracuse. This coin in specific is one of the most valuable coins uh, to this day because the die engravers were proud of their artistic uh, skill and they signed it with their name. So we know that this coin, as you can see kind of in the top here, was signed by the die engraver named Kaimon. One of the few examples of coinage we know the artist that engraved it from the ancient world. Another one by the famous die engraver Euanatos, depicting a quadriga on the back, victory crowning the uh, charioteer, armor and dolphins encircling Beautiful lady there. Another tetradam from Rhodes. Rhodes being uh, obviously the place for the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the ancient wonders of the world. Uh, many people speculate that this could have been part of the statue or an image from that ancient wonder, only now accessible to us via coinage or in our own imagination. A uh, somewhat less refined but curious stater from Knossos in Crete. And if you know your mythology, you'll recognize the Minotaur and the Labyrinth, which was at the time familiar to the Greeks. Tetragram from Chios with a Sphinx. Stator from Sikyon with a Chimera. And a Stator from Elis. This particular coin was uh, traded as a means of currency in a very specific context at the ancient Olympic Games. So when you would go and see the ancient Olympic Games, you had to exchange all your silver coinage for these type of coins that were minted in Ellis, and they would be kind of souvenirs that people would bring around with them. Now, about the middle of the fourth century BC, the Greek uh, powers at the time, Athens and Sparta, had been warring. The Peloponnesian War had severely weakened a lot of their, uh, you know, power within the area. A lot of city states were vying for control. It was sort of the end of the classical period for Greece, and the Macedonian kingdom had become a lot more influential in the north. Uh, with that, the man who really rose to become the most powerful in the area was Philip II of Macedon. And he uh, conquered the surrounding areas, except for Sparta, uh, and he really was able to set up the Macedonian and uh, Greek world for further expansion under his son, Alexander the Great. So here is a tetradrum of Alexander the Great. This one was minted in Babylon. The silver in it is most likely melted down from the treasures of King Darius and the Persians. I have a similar one on this tray up here, you can see at the end, that was uh, minted by his general Seleucus a few years after he died. But the interesting thing about Alexander, the time beyond the fact that he was one of the greatest emperor uh, generals of the, his time, was that he was one of the few people to depict himself on coinage. So although this does appear to be something like Hercules, historians are almost certain that he depicted himself. And most certainly, his generals and those who followed him depicted him as such. Here you can see him with a, an interesting headband with horns on it. Keep that in mind as you see things in the future. Horns in the ancient world on a man were symbols of divinity. This is called the horns of Ammon. 
And as he conquered throughout Persia and the Near East, he uh, took a lot of steps to show himself as a divine uh, ruler, both to kind of appeal to the local uh, beliefs in their gods and their kings as part of that divine order, and to extend his kind of popularity and, uh, I guess, notoriety. Seleucus is general with a similar depiction of horns on a helmet. And his other general, Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy became the patriarch of the Ptolemaic dynasty that would extend for centuries in Egypt. Now, again, at this point during the Hellenistic era, you can see that things are not as idealized. Um, they're not these beautiful women or kind of uh, really chiseled bodies that are almost unrealistic. These people are, are real human beings, and they have you know, unique facial fa uh, features that would be easily identifiable in other forms of art. A statue or a bust here of Ptolemy I as well to compare. And here's some of the unique uh, characters from that period, Hellenistic kings that uh, descended from the various generals of Alexander that carved up his empire. Here is a ruler from Bactria, a ruler from, uh, this poem is the entire, but he was in the Hellenistic kingdoms in the Near East, and one from the kingdom of Pergamon. You can see each one is very unique and their personality shows through. Just to show you an example, and I have uh, one of these, I didn't bring it, but a uh, drachma of one of the most distant uh, rulers of the Greek kingdoms, Menander, his kingdom was in northern India. So the Greeks under Alexander, they, they traveled very far and their influence extend all the way into India, Afghanistan, and further afield. Uh, their philosophies and things influenced Buddhism and some of the local traditions there as well. To this day, there are uh, his oral histories and written histories of this king in northern India and his influence as a Buddhist later in his life. You can see on the front are Greek letters, Basileus, Menander, and on the back in the local script. It's a bilingual. So why did I talk a lot about Greek coins? Um, Greek coins influenced almost all of the modern tradition of coinage. In China, the bronze coinage there only had Chinese characters, it never showed imagery of people, of uh, artistic qualities, political purposes. It didn't evolve in the same way. In India, they were just lumps of silver hit with a hammer with different symbols on them to show where they were being passed through or minted. The Greeks really turbocharged coinage into a form of political propaganda, uh, divinity, artistic representation, and wherever you would go and you would handle a Greek coin, you would know, wow, whoever made these coins must be talented, they must have power, and you would look and see who is this person, and you'd read their name. This is incredibly important during the Roman period because it was the easiest means of mass communication before the internet or advertising or all that. If you were buying things, you would look on the coin and see a picture of the ruler at the time. And on the back of the coin, a message that they wanted to uh, promote of some sort. So we'll see that throughout these coins. Similarly, the, uh, the Greeks had bronze, gold, and silver, although silver was their primary coin uh, for most transactions. The Romans had gold, silver, and bronze coins as well. And here's a few of the different denominations you can see. Um, some of the earlier ones, the Arius, the Denarius, and the Cistercius, as well as the As and Dupondius, and some of the later coins, the Faulus, the Siliqua, the Tremesis, the Solidus, and some of these bronze coins here. Uh, these coins were widespread uh, and used regularly. So a Cistercius might be able to buy you some groceries for the day. Uh, a Denarius might be a day's wage for a, a laborer. Denarius, uh, I think about two or three of them a year was a bonus for a Roman soldier. So that was a considerable amount. And as time went on, you'll see and pay attention, the content of the precious metal in each of these coins diminished due to hyperinflation. Everyone wanted to take a little chip out of the uh, coin to finance some project or bathhouse or whatever, and the quality of the silver and gold in these coins decreased. 
uh, with the prominence of the Roman Empire. But first, we're going to look at some of the Roman Republic. And the Roman Republic preceded that by centuries. Uh, as, or as I was saying earlier, in the Greek Empire, I don't have examples, they traded raw lumps of metal. And they just say, oh, here's some you know, copper or whatever else, and you can beat it into an object that you choose. And uh, it started to evolve. People would put them into shapes that were easily weighed at different scales. And then it started to become something similar to a coin. The Romans were imitating the Greeks at first because they, they would come into contact with Greek coinage and they would copy them. Here is one of the earliest Roman coins. It shows Hercules, similar to a coin that we saw earlier with a certain person that liked to promote themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the reverse here, a very iconic image of Romulus and Remus being suckled by she-wolf. And clearly underneath, Roman. The Romans initially copied the Greeks, but they, uh, they weren't as, <laughs> um, I guess, creative or artistically masterful as the Greeks were known to be. Sort of as a foil to uh, the uh, Greeks, they, they focused more on the quality of their silver and the kind of political and um, familial importance so that they were projecting. As time went on, you'll see that they became closer and closer to a family and then a personal uh, projection of power as the coins evolved. Here's one of an early Janus image of the Quadrigatus uh, coin. A very rare uh, gold coin. And one of the most enduring coins of the Roman Republic, and then later the Roman Empire, the denarius, which is mentioned in the Bible, and it is very common. I have a few up here. You can see when you're finished on the front, Roma, the Roman numeral X for 10, meaning 10 as, and a couple riders on the back. Now, as the, for a long time, that was the only image. The Romans were very conservative. I know uh, you remember Cato the Elder, and some of the early old school Romans were agriculturalists. They were a bit hardy. They were kind of, I, you would imagine, somewhat like our old frontiersmen in America. Uh, they kind of stuck to their guns quite literally. And they didn't uh, really like the idea of kings and uh, monarchies that they saw in the decadent Greek Hellenistic kingdoms with people projecting their egos and lavish bathhouses and all. Uh, I guess they would reach that in time, as you'll see, but at first they didn't. And as time went on, they started to evolve, put different imagery on their coins in the same way. Here, you can see some interesting imagery which shows a gladiatorial combat scene from the Roman Republic with a couple guys, different weapons. Here is a very interesting coin, which on the, again, on the front, so it's the same image, slightly different. On the reverse, this is the voting process in the ancient Roman Republic collecting the ballots and uh, compiling them in a bin over here. And uh, on the reverse of this coin is the abduction of the Sabine women from oh. Roman mythology. Um, now you'll wonder, why does this guy's last name kind of sound like Sabine? Well, in ancient Rome, in the Republic, it was a political office known as the Munier that was in charge of minting these coins and they had the honor of putting their familial name on the coinage. And many of them wanted to tie their own lineage to mythology. So this money was probably a descendant uh, or alleged descendant of someone who was related to these Sabine tribes from mythology centuries before. Again, one of the earliest uh, Roman kings before the Republic, this uh, money wanted to draw a connection to him and put his portrait on. As you can see now, it's no longer the embodiment of Rome on the coin, it is a human, even though a deceased one. And it is someone connected to said coin. So we're creeping closer towards personal aggrandizement. Now by 48 BC, we had a lot of interesting, uh, kind of tumultuous things going on in the Roman Republic, which I won't go over. I'm sure you have gone through them superficially, uh, at least in your studies. But there was a guy known as Julius Caesar, and he was uh, waging war in north of the Alps in Gaul. And he was fighting a lot of these guys. And he decided, I guess, at the time, or influenced, or was maybe part of the cult uh, cultural conversation, to have a depiction of a Gaelic warrior on a coin. And in a lot of times, 
some of these uh, coin images are the only images or references to different cultures or people because they have survived because they're made of silver or gold over wooden effigies or paintings or whatever else. So some people think that this may be the Gaelic leader Vercingetorix, who was one of the holdout kings and uh, chiefs of the Gaelic tribes who was defeated at the Battle of Alesia and paraded through Rome around this time period. You can see on here a Gaelic shield and a chariot with um, some warriors riding on it. There's the man himself, Julius Caesar. Now, at this point, we have to obvious personal kind of uh, grandeur uh, ambitions, putting your own image on a coin. Um, and this was a huge point of contention when Caesar crossed the Rubicon and seized power or tried to do, defy a lot of the uh, politically appointed officials there, the senators, they didn't like their power being taken away. So as we all know, um, skip ahead a moment, he was assassinated by Brutus. Um, this coin is one of only three in existence. A gold arc just depicts Brutus on the obverse. The reverse, Ides of March, with daggers showing the, the assassination. This was a gold coin celebrating the assassination of the leader of Rome at the time. So um, this was a little controversial, I would say. <laughs> Now, this specific coin, I'll segue uh, in a moment, but it's interesting because in the collecting market, there's a lot of ambiguity about where things come from. People dig up coins. There's a lot of hullabaloo nowadays about antiquities being traded. This particular coin was sold only a few months ago, and it was traced back to an illegal uh, excavation, and there's a big lawsuit going on in New York right now. The man who bought it paid over a million dollars, and the seller in England is going to court. So. This coin has currently been extradited to Greece and is in a museum there um, being held. So these are kind of hot commodities even now for uh, controversy in the same way. Another man from the time period, Pompey, uh, who was very influential and uh, kind of uh, vying for power within the triumvirate. Another political figure being put on a coin. Here is a very interesting coin from the later uh, triumvirate showing Mark Antony on one side, and Cleopatra. I know there's also been some arguing about what did Cleopatra look like? Uh, you know, was she dark skin? Was she light skin? Was she, you know, Egyptian? Whatever interpretation of that is. Well, you don't have to argue because there she is in all her, uh, in all her grandeur. She wasn't known for being the most beautiful woman, but she was known for being very intelligent. And she was a descendant of Ptolemy. And if you remember his somewhat large nose, uh, you can see she was inheriting that, so. <laughs> All right, so uh, here's a denarius coin, again, with Augustus. Uh, if you remember, the, one of the uh, competitors with, um, with uh, Julius Caesar at the time was Crassus. Crassus got killed in Parthia on a failed military expedition, and he lost the eagle standard to the Parthians, which was a big political conundrum at the time. And uh, Augustus, or Octavian, the ruler at the time, was able to negotiate to get it back. And this is his um, projection of imperial authority by restoring the eagle standard. Oops. Restoring the eagle standard into the Temple of Mars, representation of war. So that was him saying, I recovered this very valuable or symbolic uh, eagle standard. Now I'm just going to show you a few of these imperial rulers. Um, here we have a denarius of Augustus and Tiberius. So this became a legitimizing transfer of authority. Uh, early on, a lot of these emperors were hereditary, but later they would become adoptive, meaning the emperor would choose someone who was not their son to become the emperor. And it was, for a while, a stable source of uh, inheriting power, which would unravel as time went on. Here we have a beautiful Cistercius of Agrippina, the mother of Nero, who was uh, not a very nice lady. Uh, I'll let you read about her if you really want to know the details. Here we have an Arius of a young Nero, a gold coin, and a larger coin of a less attractive older Nero, um, somewhat Trumpian. And uh, here it is Cistercius of Aspasian as well. And to show you some of the uh, the political goals of the time. This shows on the back, Judea Capta. 
the conquest of Judea. So does anyone uh, know where, that else, where else that was represented in a famous Roman monument? Off the top, you can yell it out. Arch of Titus? Yes, Arch of Titus. Conquered with the menorah being carried back. I've been there, and you can see it still right there on the wall. So these coins were projecting that. They're saying, I'm powerful enough that I conquered all of Judea. And here's my face. Here's what I did. And you can see it if you walk to Rome as well. Here, uh, I think this might be incorrect here. I might have messed up one of the mistakes, but I wanted to show you some of the Roman empresses who were also depicted on coins because as people died or people took office, they were deified. And if you can see in statues of the Yale on the gallery, the Roman women, had, just like today, had all sorts of fashions, and the empress were very influential at the time. So she wore quite an interesting hairdo. And the uh, depictions of the empresses at this time and the emperors were becoming much more realistic compared to Julius Caesar's cartoonish portrait. And they became a high uh, point for the Roman Empire. If you see you know, carvings from the time period of Augustus, Hadrian, Trajan, that era, of uh, the Antonine dynasties, they're some of the most remarkable and lifelike uh, of all of them. To show you another here, not only were emperors and empresses uh, depicted on coinage, but influential figures uh, as well. This is the uh, medallion of Antinous. Antinous was the gay lover of the emperor Hadrian. Hadrian also had a wife, so when his lover Antinous died, uh, he was so kind of stricken with grief that he had him depicted on coins and in statues and made a god figure, uh, sort of a kind of a beautiful young man. Um, and his imagery can be found as well. Some other interesting coins, a Trajan, the emperor, with kind of a uh, military procession. A medallion of Commodus showing his, uh, again, a recurrent theme, desire to be like Alexander with a Herculean uh, lion's head. And if any of you have seen the movie Gladiator, uh, you know that Commodus liked to kind of dress up and put on a performance in the arena. And he even projected that himself with images of himself dressed up as Hercules. A little bit more of that. And uh, later during the Severan dynasty, we had different hairdos again. Uh, and here we have Julia Domna. This was the wife of the Emperor Septimius Severus and her two sons. So these coins show succession, potential rulers in the future, and their age as they go on. Uh, if any of you know, uh, Caracalla and Geta, the sons of Julia Domna and Septimius Severus, didn't get along very well. And uh, Caracalla had his brother murdered uh, in order to kind of eliminate a contestant with the throne. And he also wanted to be a little bit like Alexander, so he had a few more coins made. Now, somewhere down the line in this whole uh, situation, the inflation and the rampant uh, spending and the military crises and poor governing uh, basically made the government run out of money. So at, over time, what they had done is kill coins that were of purity, maybe 95%. They, make them only 90% and 85%. And they do this over and over because they could keep a cut of the silver as they circulated the same coins. Well, after 150, 200 years of that, we ended up with coins with no silver in them. And they just had a little foil on the top and it's created an economic crisis that is known today as Gresham's Law. Uh, and if any of you have any experience with economics, uh, you know that means that if you mint good money and you mint bad money, the bad money drives the good money out of circulation because people hoard it, especially when it's precious metal. So when coins would come out, people would take the ones that were of higher value and hold on to those and, and circulate the ones of lower quality, drive inflation up, economy is doing poorly, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so here we have Diocletian's attempt to remedy this. He started minting a silver coin. And as you see now in the later Roman period, the depictions of people have waned again. They're starting to get pretty poor, cartoonish. Um, but you start to see the influence of late Roman Byzantine um, styles come into existence. And you see a lot more generals becoming emperors, military leaders because of the crises at hand. Here we go, uh, Diocletian is showing a military fortress maybe projecting security to a kind of divided empire. 
And, but for most of the coins at this time, they were very low quality and they were in large amounts. You probably can stick a shovel anywhere in Eastern Europe now and not find one of these. They're not extremely valuable at all. I've seen these sold for $25. Um, there's millions of them minted and there's still millions of them all over the place from hyperinflation. People didn't value them very much or they had to exchange a lot of them. You also start to see sort of Byzantine-like imageries, frontal-facing portraits. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is Maxentius, who I'm sure you all know was not a very big fan of Christians. Um, and you can see him there, commemorating one of the earliest coins. There's some statuary to show some of this late Roman um, sculpting technique. It's becoming less lifelike, a bit more cartoonish. And here's an interesting coin as well. So by this point, the Emperor Constantine had taken over amongst all this chaos, military leaders, spouted, whatnot. And uh, he made one significant change to the Roman Empire. If you notice what's on the coin, you can shout it out. Yes. Christianity was becoming very popular. It was no longer um, repressed. And Constantine made it officially recognized. Not the official religion, but it was sanctioned. There was no more big purges, at least for the moment. This man was one of the last people to try that. Uh, his name is Julian II, uh, but to many Christian writers at the time, he was Julian the Apostate. He, was, and I have an exact uh, uh, version of this coin on the trailer if you want to look at it at the end. Uh, he was kind of a neo-pagan, and he didn't like that Christianity was coming. He wrote a lot of um, texts defending paganism, and there were a lot of Christians that um, kind of made fun of his beard and tried to, you know, go for very other, uh, various other highly intellectual uh, debates. And uh, you can see him trying to encapsulate that with some pagan imagery, some throwbacks to the old emperors here. But he was not successful. He was uh, a little bit of an old soul. And the later Christian emperors uh, really abandoned that and embraced Christianity fully. Here we have a later one from the 5th century as the Western Roman Empire is in true turmoil. And you can see what was once a victory on the ancient Greek coinage. Maybe a victory, but there's something quite obvious in the foreground here being held up. Um, and that's something to keep in mind as you all con continue your studies. How much Christian imagery borrows from ancient pagan imagery? Is it an angel or is it a winged victory or Nike? You know, is it... Um, I don't have great, all sorts of great examples, but you can see the parallels as time goes on. Some of the earliest images of Christ in Byzantine uh, mosaics are said to have come from imagery of Serapis or ancient Roman figures before they transformed into different imagery as time went on. The influence is very obvious once you see it. The bronze coinage was completely crap at this point, and uh, they had, this coin was probably about the size of smaller than your pinky nail in real life, and they were running out of uh, even bronze to mint. It was complete chaos in the Western Roman Empire, and Rome was under siege, and so they had moved the capital to Ravenna for some of the Western Roman emperors at the time. This right here is a very rare gold coin, very small, of Romulus Augustulus, the child emperor and the last Western Roman emperor before the Goths completely took over at the fall of Rome. Now, this isn't the end of the story for Rome, but we only have so much time. We have a whole thousand years more, and I'm sure you would love to be glued to your seats listening to me talk more about it, uh, through the Byzantine Empire all the way up to the 15th century when Constantinople fell, with an interesting evolution of different rulers, images of Christian um, you know, belief and things like that. But I will cap it here and say that we've gone through 900 years of Western Roman and Greek coinage with a lot of different evolution in a little bit of time. And uh, you can see here that the Germanic um, tribes had taken over at this point and started their own sort of depiction of what they thought a ruler would look like with this wonderful hairdo. Um, I'm sure they thought it was great in this little mustache. Now you can also see the Byzantine transition. And finally, I thought you would find this interesting, and then I'll just open the floor up to questions. Uh, and feel free to ask me whatever. I'll try and answer the best of my ability. But these are four coins that you can buy, that you can see now, 
that are mentioned in the Bible by the apostles and people that handled them. So I know people make arguments all the time about, you know, oh, we don't have evidence of whatever happened in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. Well, these are real tangible things that we can link to that. Um, so I'll mention a few here. So from Mark and Luke, this is a widow's mite. If you know the story of the widow in the temple uh, who deposited two very small coins and there was a, a showboat who came in and dumped a big bucket of silver in there uh, that Christ said, you know, along the lines of, you know, she has done a greater deed by putting a small coin in than this rich man because she had nothing to give to begin with. These coins are still pretty worthless. You can get them for under $10 now. Um, but they would have been in widespread circulation, and they find them all over Jerusalem today. Um, one of the ancient uh, kind of rulers of Judea, Alexander Genius. Down here, you have a tetradram of Tiberius from Antioch. Now, this coin cannot be certainly pinned to the mention of the Bible, but is very likely, the, and there are maybe a couple other contenders, from Matthew. This is the coin that when people were complaining about paying taxes, as they often do, uh, today and then, uh, Jesus held this coin and said, uh, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And we know because at the time of Jesus' life, there were only a few people that could have been the, you know, the emperor of Rome because it was still pretty early in the empire. And this was probably the most likely coin at the time to be in that area. This tetragem showing the emperor Tiberius. In the uh, lower right corner here, corner here, we have a shekel which was a uh, kind of a Semitic standard of coin. And today, if you still, if you go to uh, Israel, they use that as their unit, a shekel. It harkens back to this. And this coin was uh, used as a means of exchange at the temple uh, in Jerusalem for the Jews at the time. And it was a few, full, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they didn't like the idea of paying temple tax uh, for religious purposes that had images of Roman emperors and leaders on them. They thought that was a bit too much dirt in their eye and it was also sacrilegious. But they still have no problem uh, putting this image of Melkart, who was a Phoenician deity, on their coin. And the second reason is because the silver purity was very high. And we know this is to be true at the time because there are uh, Jewish histories that mention silver coinage from the temple having to be made at Tyre. So this would have been a coin that they exchanged. This would have been used in the context when Jesus uh, kind of went into a little bit of a fury and flipped over tables in the temple because they were exchanging these coins for Roman silver because of the purity. So this would have been a coin that Jesus witnessed. This is from in the year that he was crucified. And is also considered to be the coin that was found in the fish's mouth in, in the New Testament story about paying the temple tax and is hypothesized as being the coin that was paid to Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. Uh, these coins are quite valuable nowadays in good condition, $2,000 or so, but you can hold them in your hands, just like the apostles did. And finally, this is a very interesting one to me. I have one here if you'd like to see it at the end. This is a lepton, or sometimes known as a pruta, minted by Pontius Pilate uh, in Judea in uh, Jerusalem, and we know this to be true because these coins were minted by the governors of Judea, and there are records from Rome showing the continuity that matches that, and they were minted with the year in Roman numerals, Oop. Roman numerals, and then Tiberius in, uh, on the front. So that was minted under Pontius Pilate, very well could have passed through Christ's hands or any of the people that were characters at the time. Um, and I think that's pretty remarkable uh, what Coinage has to teach and also to inspire uh, belief and conviction in all sorts of things today. So with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation and I'm willing to take any questions or just show you coins if you want to see the real thing. So I, my question is, can you get into a little bit about how they were made? Were they, were they actually like heated and pressed and they would etch the mold or how would, how would that happen? So 
Some coins were minted in different ways, but usually the way they would be done, the way it would be done is you would have a mold that would make blanks. They were almost like little flat disks or little drops of silver or bronze. And then those were heated up before they completely solidified and they were struck with a hammer. So there would be a reverse and an obverse die. The obverse die uh, was usually a negative iron um, kind of disc, cylinder of sorts, and they would carve the image in taglio or in the negative into that die. And then on the hammer uh, or mallet that they were using to push into the coin or hit the coin, it had a punch mark to kind of grip it and to give a unique pattern that would be hard to uh, make a forgery of. And so they would put that on the, uh, on the die and they would swing a hammer full force, like a sledgehammer, and hit it right on there. And if you notice throughout that, all the coins were slightly off-centered. Um, that was because of that. They were each, each one unique and hit in a different way, slightly off-centered. Um, and then the bronze coins were uh, made in molds as well. Uh, and so that, that continued in lar for large part, in large part for centuries um, until we made them with modern presses that were more accurate. Does that answer the question? Anyone else? Thank you for the presentation. I just was wondering that if you know that coins that were found in the in the Holy Shroud in the eyes of the of Christ. I don't know off the top of my head. It would be interesting. Um, so I guess I won't I won't uh, speak out of with conjecture. I, I'm not certain, but it was a tradition that came from the Greeks to place a small coin, an oval, on each eye. Uh, to pay the boatman, Charon, to cross the river Styx in the afterlife. So it would have probably been a small silver coin during Christ's life, which could have been Greek, um, or it could have been a Roman coin. So, sometimes some of the brothers ask, how can we actually become experts in so many things, so many topics that we study in the humanities program? And I think you gave us a great example. By focusing on something like, like coins, you spoke about literature, about art, about history, about poetry, about everything. So that's a great example. We obviously cannot know everything about everything, but focusing on one thing actually is the way to learn a little bit about everything else. So would you like to expand a little bit more on that just so that they uh, can yeah. follow so, your example? Sure, I think um, without getting too uh, into the weeds and without getting like too complex, um, you realize with things like coins or clothing or whatever that across time and in different periods these things influence one another. Um, so they, they're not in isolation and the trends with coins are widespread and they're used uh, historically um, to kind of identify those but also chronologically to mark time periods. So one of the biggest thing that uh, one of the biggest things that's valued in archaeological digs are coins. Because if you find a coin on the site you know that it would have probably been circulated within a fifth, plus or minus 50 years of that time that burial was done. Um, I think that the thing about coins that really is interesting, and you know, with other archaeologists and specialists, and I am not one, but uh, they become very interested in is you, you understand something that someone else did thousands of years ago in your own life and sometimes you can replicate it, whether it's making the clothes and you start to understand things about that person's life, sometimes how different it was or even more often how similar it was. Um, with coinage, I think it brings you closer uh, because a lot of time when you read history it sounds abstract, like you're thinking about it. Centuries ago, how could it have any impact on me today? And when you hold something in your hand or you see something in person and it's tangible and it's real, you think, okay, you know, I'm holding the same thing that someone held 2,000 years ago, bought a loaf of bread with, you know, betrayed Jesus with potentially. <laughs> and that, that really kind of uh, marks you in a different way than it would just from reading it in a book or just seeing a picture of it on the internet. So I think if you have a passion, uh, it can really make things more meaningful to you in that sense. I don't know if that was a good answer or not, but Definitely. anyone else? If not, you guys feel free to come up and have a look at this. In the back, I thought I saw one. Yeah, I know. Uh, Father John, you spoke on the phone in Arlington uh, last 
Yes, we, we passed. We passed yeah, yeah. one another, unfortunately. So, um, sorry. I know I had. I was here for a little bit. Had to jump out. So, if you've already answered this question, I'll uh, watch the recording. But um, <laughs> my brother, who collects, he tries to collect currencies. He, he uh, so I, I took a picture, told him we were having this awesome talk, and he, he's like, please, 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 ask him what is uh, your maybe the like. The history, you know, so when you touch a coin, and I think you might have just talked about that right now, but mm -hmm. what is the most like personal story or historical aspect of the the coins that you've been in contact with? You know, like let's say I've seen a coin from you know with Alexander the, the Great's head on it or something like that. So I took one of them out of here, and there are many examples. This is a great question. Um, of coins because of the imagery on them, and because of the time and the context, we know for certain that they were handled by the people that minted them and the rulers depicted on them, and they were used in very important ceremonies and for gifts. So there are uh, gold medallions, for example, with the emperor on them that we know those were used as political gifts from the emperor. So they were held in the hand of Commodus or Marcus Aurelius or Trajan, and they were handed out personally by the emperor. So you're holding the same coin as the Roman emperor on the coin. There are other examples, like uh, I had one up there that was, I took out for the sake of time. Uh, if anyone knows about Alexander the Great, uh, one of his final campaigns was into India, and he fought uh, Indian King Porus at the Hydaspes River, uh, which was a kind of a uh, climactic battle with elephants. And there are, there's a rare coin, about five of them, and it depicts him fighting King Porus on the back of an elephant. And we know that was a coin handed out by King Alexander the Great or to uh, the kings of the area as a diplomatic gift or as an honor for his senior officers. That's the same coin in your hand. Um, there are other coins uh, that were minted and used to pay Roman soldiers, denarii coins that are of that example. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Uh, there's one that I really enjoy. It's pretty boring in terms of visual appeal, but it was melted down from the emperor's um, silverware to pay uh, masons to rebuild the walls of Constantinople during the siege by the Ottomans. And they found about 20 of them buried in the rubble, excavating Istanbul about 25 years ago. Um, and you know those coins were held in those people's hands. Uh, real historical figures, real people, oftentimes people you only think, you know, so far removed from us that they may not even have been real. But when you know that that coin is there, it's in your hands, you know they were real, and they experienced all those things you read about. So I, I could go on and on, but if you want to delve into it, I can, I can give you some more examples later. Any other questions? I think they wanted to see the coin. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Oh my God, I know this was I'm fascinating. My brother lives in Great, uh, great Falls, Great Church. It's Northern Virginia. Oh, Falls Church. Falls Church. Oh, yeah, Is that where you live? Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm off. Yes. Is it? Yeah. Oh my. So, do you have the same birthday as you? Do you mind if I take a picture? Yeah, no. I no, 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 no,
So you can see this one, the face is a little closer to the edge. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. It adds a bit more unique quality to every single one. Yeah. And uh, the quality of the coins oftentimes can vary dramatically, or the price of the coin can vary dramatically based on that. Mm -hmm. They're both, you know, both sides are really off-centered. People want it. If it's perfectly centered, it might be $10,000. So, 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 so this, this one's from where? When? This one is uh, with uh, so, a Seleucid yeah. coin. It's from Babylon. It's from the 4th century before Christ. And that's uh, Alexander the Great on the front and Zeus on the reverse. Wow. I always had a doubt over why they were not perfectly circular. 